On Health Matters, Television for Life, a new tool in the battle against breast cancer, genetic testing. Finding out that a family has a risk for cancer allows us to be more proactive. And how programs like Live Strong help cancer survivors get back on their feet and thrive after treatment. Being able to bond with people going through the same thing was a comfort. From cancer diagnosis to a post-treatment plan for getting back to living. Surviving breast cancer, right now on Health Matters. Health Matters is made possible with the support of Washington State University Health Sciences Spokane and Providence Healthcare. With every twist and shout and every mended heart, we see you, you who trusts us to take care. Providence, health for all, care for you. Good evening, I'm Teresa Lukens. Health Matters has a long tradition here at KSPS, and this season the show has a new format, one that allows us to dig deeper into each month's topic. We begin this season with breast cancer and what patients need to know from diagnosis to treatment and beyond. If you have a family history of cancer, a genetic test can help determine your risk for the disease and what measures to take to be proactive. Jamie Parker went through the process when she learned there was cancer on both sides of her family. Cancer is something that a lot of people just, you know, cross their fingers and hope they don't get. For me, I know it's more likely in my family that it could happen. So anything that I can do to be proactive and get out in front of it, I see as a win. Jamie Parker doesn't have cancer, but both of her parents are cancer survivors, and that's what led her to see a genetic counselor. A lot of what I do is identifying families that have a genetic or inherited risk for cancer, and finding out that a family has a risk for cancer allows us to be more preventative or proactive with their medical care. They went back two generations in Jamie's family history. Her father showed a genetic variant that indicates increased risk for cancer, and that led to the discovery that Jamie has the same gene. So depending on which gene is involved, it allows me to communicate to the patient what types of cancers they're at increased risk for, um, in many cases how high those risks are, and also what to do about that. Like many genetic counseling patients, breast cancer is highest on Jamie's risk assessment, but she also has a predisposition to colon cancer and stomach cancer. It's kind of sobering when you first hear that you have a genetic propensity for cancer. Um, it took a minute to process and it's not just impacting me, it's of course impacting my children as well. Because of her risk level, Jamie now qualifies for accelerated screenings and she's taking advantage of resources to reduce her risk. I have a counselor and we meet multiple times a year and we talk about my holistic health, how we're gonna approach that and that includes screenings and medicines and nutrition and anything that I can do to be proactive. Genetic counseling is not for everyone. Is this information you wanna know about yourself or is this gonna be something that ultimately is more stressful or more damaging to you to just know that you have this risk. But for Jamie Parker, forewarned is forearmed. At the end of the day, it is what it is. And if I have a tool that I can use to fight cancer, then I'm happy to have that tool in my toolbox. And joining me now is Dr. Stephanie Moline. She's a surgical oncologist at Cancer Care Northwest. And Vicki Dodson, a registered nurse and patient navigator at Providence Sacred Heart Medical Center. Thank you both for being here. Dr. Moline, tell us a little bit more about genetic testing. Are you seeing more patients interested in knowing more um, about genetic testing? Well, genetic testing is testing your cells and all of your cells have the same copies throughout each cell, not just in the breast. So when we're speaking of genetic testing, we can talk about for that person and also for the tumor. We do genetic testing on tumor mutations to look for spe specific mutations to direct medication. Um, as far as genetic testing for a family risk, it's something you could get from your mom or your dad, and it's 50-50. Breast cancer is not specific for either side, and we're definitely doing 
more genetic testing. Another thing that made it more possible was the inclusion in the Affordable Care Act now that all insurance carriers have to cover it if the circumstances are right. It certainly is something that has been more available and open to the public since celebrities have shared some of their results. And we want to be clear, this isn't the commercial genetic testing that people are doing from some of the companies that are putting out commercials that we're seeing on TV and that sort of thing. That's great. Certain companies are looking at lots of genes for other reasons, and those are probably expanding every year or so. There's adding new genes. That does not cover but a very, very limited number of genes for breast cancer mm -hmm. and a very limited subpopulation. So that doesn't apply to 99% of people in the country. As a patient navigator, Vicki, would you work with someone who was concerned about those things or do you just simply pick up once a diagnosis happens? Well, normally I do pick up with once a diagnosis happens, but sometimes they'll come in and they've not got the diagnosis to begin with and they'll start asking questions about or we'll discuss about, um, you know, my, my mom had it or my dad had it or something was going on and, and what should they be looking for. Um, in which I usually will encourage them to speak with their doctors. Um, we do have um, referrals for genetic testing, et cetera, through Providence, and um, I'm happy to give them information that they can follow through with if they choose to. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about diagnosis, Dr. Moline. It is not as cookie cutter, um, I think, as, as we'd like to think it is. We find a lump, we see something on a mammogram, and we begin treatment, whether it's surgery or chemotherapy or radiation, but it's not that clear cut. No, if we printed the guidelines, it would take over 100 book pages. It's really hard to wrap your head around all the new and exciting treatment things, which just means there's different pathways. It's not one size fits all, it's one size fits one, that there will be a pathway, and sometimes, if we're good and lucky, several pathways that a woman might follow that are all correct. So what is the first thing a patient should be asking um, their doctor once they are diagnosed then in order to make sure they're, the, they're taking the right course of treatment? Usually a breast cancer diagnosis starts with a surgeon to direct care. Um, almost every breast cancer is going to require having the primary site where it started taken out, kind of call it home base. We're taking out what the original tumor cells and then working on an assessment to see, did it spread? Did it go somewhere else? And then using medicines and other treatments to treat the cells that might have left the breast before we even knew they were there. So the surgeon might be the lead on a team of doctors or healthcare providers. It's definitely a team. But yes, we might be the first person that most patients with breast cancer will see. So I can only imagine what it's like to be sitting across from the doctor when you get that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, not maybe hearing everything they're saying. You're trying to process this information. Turning to a patient navigator would help you navigate through those Absolutely. complicated? We highly recommend when patients are going in to meet with their doctors to bring a second person with them because um, the stress is, is incredibly high just meeting um, to hear what the doctor has to say and, and you reach a, a certain point where you just don't hear much of anything else um, and so having that second set of ears is um, really important so that you have that backup to figure out what, what's going on and what's happening. I am one more person that would be able to go in um, with the doctor's permission to, to come in and, and listen in so that um, I have an idea of what um, the, the plan is because the pathway may be um, unique and, and so I, if hearing what I want to, what they want to do, then I can step in and say, Okay, this is what the doctor said. Remember, this is what we're what we're going to do, um, and offer that 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 support um, and clarification, so that they can um, ease some of that fear of what's happening. Because a lot of times, if you if you don't know what's happening, the fear is more just the unknown mm -hmm. versus just trying to figure out the the, the whole picture. For so them. a family member could play a role mm -hmm. in that but as a navigator and a neutral party, you may be able to better explain, and as someone who might even understand the medical terms that could be involved mm -hmm. in that path, just an added piece to the puzzle? Yes, I, I usually I'll tell the, the patients that I speak doctor. So sometimes, you know, the, those bigger words that, that just don't quite come into to effect, you, you're able to have that time, the extra time, um, when the, patient, the doctor stepped out, 
that I can, okay, this is, this is what the doctor said. Um, this is littler words to, for them to figure, to be able to make those decisions and what they're gonna do. Mm -hmm. And because surgery is usually the first course of treatment, as you Very mentioned, cool. what do patients need to know to prepare to go through that surgery? ahead of time, mentally, physically? Well, just know it's incredibly safe to have procedures now and that we've got all the best techniques. We sit in an area where we are blessed with excellent medical support on all avenues, including surgery, anesthesia, um, and support for management of symptoms. Um, like I tell people when they come, I said we know that the average person hearing such a big meeting and a meeting with a doctor such as a cancer diagnosis, here's about 25% of what we say. So if you bring a couple people with you and hopefully we've written it down and given you a copy of our list and you have some other sources of information, you have somebody to talk to later. So it can be your best friend, your husband, your mother, sister, family member, or if we're really lucky, all three, then you'll have someone to kind of bounce ideas off of. I don't think any of us learn anything very difficult the first time. We had to practice long division a while, so you have to practice some of these things and roll it out in your head to come up with what's right for you and to ponder, really ponder. And what about post-surgery? It's not something we don't often talk about. What can a patient expect after they uh, get out of a surgical procedure? And I guess it really depends maybe on what procedure they undergo, but. I was thinking capital I, capital D, it depends. Mm -hmm. It depends, mm -hmm. but we do have lots of educational materials and uh, ability to talk to someone to give them a good expectation of what, what to expect. Mm -hmm. Can a patient navigator also, um, Vicki, help to clear up uh, some of the confusion with how am I going to pay for this? What about my insurance? Mm -hmm. I mean, that yes. can, becomes a very big concern for people. We have um, lists of resources, and, and part of, of with patients um, is getting them connected to where um, they need to be. There's a lot of changes that go on with insurances and, and which plan will cover what kind of thing. So um, a lot of what I do is um, getting them connected with the people they need to talk to, um, whether it be our financial counselors or um, we have several foundations in the area that can assist in some of the things that you don't even think about with with patients. Um, you know, we have patients that have come in that younger women that have children, and I'm going through treatment, mm -hmm. and what do I do with my children? I, I don't have that. So there's there's places out there. We just have to get them connected with that, and it's I make a lot of phone calls on patients' behalves to be able to get. Right. Their, their needs met so they can get through this. Mm -hmm. Have patient advocates with that mm -hmm. idea yes. to help navigate what that person needs. Um, they're awesome group. And to put also a plug out for uh, extra advertising for the BCCHP program, mm -hmm. which is a state program for Washington. And every state has the same program, just a different name between states, to help make sure women are getting the screening and that financial limitations should not be an obstacle for getting a mammogram, mm -hmm. getting a biopsy. And then if we find something on biopsy, to be able to afford to do treatment. It's many countries in the world do have some screening program, but absolutely no follow-up so you get diagnosed and you still can't do anything about it would be a terrible tragedy. Mm -hmm. So there are programs in the state and almost every medical facility office will be able to connect women up with that. Mm -hmm. And then to make sure too that you're doing your post-treatment as well. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Follow up, it covers follow up yeah. from the day you're diagnosed. In fact, we say people wanna know when, when do I get to be cancer free? I said you're a breast cancer survivor from the day we find it. And so that, that can be a long period of time and not one set point on the calendar. Right. And that will, should cover that entire follow-up. All right, well thank you both very much for being here. Uh, we wanna turn our attention now to life after breast cancer. Treating breast cancer is tough on the body. There's surgery, chemo, radiation's a possibility. It can take a toll. That's where the Live Strong program comes in. It helps cancer survivors learn how to cope with life after their illness. Kara Lamb was 38 when test results confirmed she had breast cancer. I was the healthiest I'd ever been. At the time, there was nobody in my family um, you know, that had cancer. And I thought, no, this, this isn't happening to me. Her life, she says, stopped for cancer. I think I didn't process it until 
a year later when it was all said and done and you actually had a moment to like take in what had just been through your life. At some point during her treatment, Kara was given a piece of paper that mentioned the YMCA's Live Strong program. When they step through those doors, our goal is to meet each individual where they are, whether that's physically, emotionally, mentally. And you're gonna slide those elbows back, pinching the shoulder blades together, and then release, okay? Victoria is a personal trainer and a Live Strong coach. She helps cancer survivors like Kara learn how to exercise all over again with bodies that can't do what they once did. Yes. Our motto is go low and go slow, so not jumping into something uh, that might not be safe. Just as important as the exercise is community time, where survivors can share in a safe place. Being able to bond with people going through the same thing was a comfort and definitely made me feel like I wasn't alone but also knowing that, okay, there's gonna be coaches and other people that are gonna help me get back on my feet and do it the right way without hurting myself. And then you can stay on one side or you can alternate. And it's that support on the gym floor or around a table that helps each cancer survivor grow stronger. Through the course of those 12 weeks, it's like they light up. They become more themselves again and Cancer isn't that limiting factor for them anymore. Each Live Strong class is given a graduation party, a chance for everyone to celebrate victories and look ahead to living stronger. It's one of those things that I just know this isn't gonna be forever. I'm still gonna power through. Like, cancer can't take me down. If caught early, we know that many people survive breast cancer, but getting through treatment isn't the end. In fact, it's just the beginning for survivors. Here to discuss life after breast cancer is Heather Gabbert. She's a registered dietitian and oncology specialist at Cancer Care Northwest, and Nicole Manus, the community health director for the YMCA for the Inland Northwest. And ladies, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, Nicole, tell us more about the Live Strong program. We saw a little slice of it in that piece. Yeah, Live Strong at the YMCA is a collaborative partnership between the Live Strong Foundation and the YMCA um, on a national level. So we've been running the program locally for seven years. Um, and it's not just for breast cancer survivors, it really is for um, survivors of any cancer type. And it is open to survivors really at any point uh, during or after treatments, provided their um, doctor has cleared them for exercise. And why has this become so important for survivors? Great question. So um, survivorship for most people is the longest segment of the cancer journey. And while, um, while cancer has certainly a lot of physical impacts, uh, both the, the disease itself um, and the treatment, there's also significant emotional and psychosocial and spiritual impacts of the disease. And, all of those can be long lasting. Um, so it's important for survivors to have an opportunity to focus on their whole person wellness post-treatment. At the point where everyone else thinks, yay, you're done, it often can feel like it's, it's still um, very much alive and kind of just the beginning of the bigger journey. Mm -hmm. I would guess too that that emotional piece becomes very critical. Absolutely. We actually spend about a third of our program time um, helping folks to kind of focus on and process through that emotional work. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, um, Heather, uh, patients or people who have gone through treatment have to focus a lot on nutrition paired with what they're doing either at the gym or, or getting back to life as they know it. Is Absolutely. that right? That's right, that's right. And you know, fatigue is the one of the number one complaints that we hear from patients, especially as Nicole mentioned, after the treatment is done. and it continues on and with fighting that fatigue you can really focus on your nutrition and we really try to focus in on anti-inflammatory foods or foods that have anti-inflammatory properties because you've just been through a major inflammatory response and it's really important to get that anti-inflammatory uh, component from your nutrition. Mm -hmm. So what should patients be eating post-treatment? You know, it really goes back to omega-3, omega-3, omega-3s. And the, the gold standard is Alaskan caught salmon, um, low mercury tuna, um, uh, cal or halibut cod, 
those fish are going to be the gold standard, but also getting more from your plant-based foods. They offer omega-3s and they're majorly anti-inflammatory, so they can just calm down those signals in your body. Um, another thing to focus on is probiotics. But the big thing in the news now is the microbiome, and we know that that's huge. That's the basis for a lot of our um, discomforts and our ailments and things, and so we can really um, include fermented foods in our nutrition. Um, you know, some people are like, what, kimchi, what? Um, kombucha, um, even fermented sauerkraut, yogurt, uh, kefir, those things are gonna be very important. So really a strong recommendation from myself is to get fermented foods in daily, if mm -hmm. you can. Mm -hmm. and, and Nicole, if they're doing that, um, along with the Live Strong program and some of the exercise routines, how, what kind of a difference can they make? Well, it's pretty significant. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of folks come out of treatment and say, you know, I feel worse than I did at the point that I was diagnosed. And so if they can, can get these supports early, um, and we're seeing more and more people that are actually engaging in the program while in treatment. So if they're getting support from a dietitian, doing the nutrition work during treatment, and then continue that, um, and get and stay as physically active as possible. Mm -hmm. um, it can both support treatment and then help people return to wellness so much more quickly. Mm -hmm. And does that include cardio and weight-bearing exercises? Yeah, so the program is pretty comprehensive. Um, it's um, really balanced from the perspective of everyone's doing some cardiovascular work, some muscle strength and endurance work, um, balance and flexibility work. Some of the treatments can really impact things like balance and flexibility. Um, and, and very often there is um, muscle that is lost through a period of treatment and inactivity. Um, and then some of the chemotherapy can really impact heart and lungs as well. So all of it is really important. And we do some baseline assessments so we know where individuals are starting and then really tailor the program to individual goals and needs. Well, that's what I was just wondering because everybody's different. So Absolutely. making sure that they are tailored to, to what that particular person needs must be critical. Absolutely. You know, and some folks are coming in um, fairly mobile. Others may be coming in, you know, using a walker or in a wheelchair or on oxygen. So it, it really is going to be um, radically different based on what a person's starting point is um, and what their goals are. So using a program like Live Strong is also important to making sure you're doing it right. Yes. <laughs> so all of our coaches, um, in addition to the coaches being certified personal trainers, they've gone through some considerable additional training to really understand uh, the impacts of cancer treatment and side effects, to know how to deal with things um, like if someone has a colostomy or they've got lymphedema, uh, the various side effects that are really specific to cancer treatment, they're going to get support from trainers who understand. Mm -hmm. how and in to the end, avoid some injuries, I would think, too. Absolutely. Yeah. And folks may have come with a significant uh, exercise background. But once you've been through cancer treatment, the body doesn't function the same as it did before. Uh, so they may need support pacing themselves in a different way or learning some alternative exercises as they work toward getting back to where they might have been before. Mm -hmm. and, and Heather, getting to those goals, you mentioned some of the foods that are critical in making that happen. Mm -hmm. But what should um, patients avoid? Eating. That is a good point. So especially with, since we're talking about breast cancer and Breast Cancer Awareness Month, it's very important to know that um, the estrogen-based cancers, we really still need to avoid soy or concentrated soy um, in our diets. It's um, strongly estrogenic. And if we're going through procedures like double mastectomies and hysterectomies and we're trying to get the estrogen out of our bodies and then we're going on tamoxifen and other aromatase inhibitors, we really need to um, focus in on that and be aware of soy um, in our diets. Um, there's a lot of soy lecithin added to foods. Um, there's soybean oil in almost everything in every dressing, mayonnaise, things like that. So it, it's really looking at those labels and being aware, and that's a large part of my education, um, post-treatment, especially for the estrogen receptor positive breast well, cancers. Because we hear so much about soy being healthy, I, I'm surprised to hear that. Yes, and it'd be, it's great. The soy proteins are great for um, those who might have colon cancer. It's great for digestive health, um, but when we have a, a hormone-based cancer like 
um, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, we really need to be aware of that and limit the soy intake. Mm -hmm. um, another question I get a lot is, um, you know, or the statement, I know I'm avoiding sugar, sugar feeds cancer. And I said, well, you know, in theory, yes, that's absolutely true. Cancer um, grows easily with sugar. However, what we need to think about is it's really inflammation that feeds illness and cancers. And along with inflammation comes the elevated blood sugars. And so if we can really get our nutrition timing and um, try to have our nutrition every three to four hours and not go past that four hour time frame, especially when we're in treatment or in aftercare, um, that can really help our blood sugars stay nice and stable and it's not so easy for that cancer then to grow. So right, we're not making it too easy. Mm -hmm. How long do you work with a person post-treatment, post-diagnosis? Um, I'm the only dietitian at Cancer Care at this time, mm. so um, I'm, I have, uh, I get to see some patients more often. Uh, it depends on if they're um, able to come in, if they have mm. insurance coverage as well. Uh, so I hopefully get to see them for at least a few months following that. Um, so much so, I actually, in talking with Jill, she said, you know, there's just, this is when things happen. It's after nutrition, or after um, cancer treatment. Mm. And so it's really, I had a calling and I'm, we're gonna do a meal delivery service now for those and for everybody, but really it's so that pa patients don't have to worry about thinking about dinner and finding that energy for dinner. Um, and I went through, I was also a patient mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago and Nicole and the group at Live Strong saved me. Um, I was a Zumba instructor and when I came in there, I was so deconditioned. I um, they call me elliptical girl now <laughs> um, because I was just I just went into the, the elliptical did that for a couple of minutes but they work very closely with that physical component and the emotional aspects that go into it and so to have that knowledge mm. of the nutrition and then have that fall into everything really helps and I think the patients they are very appreciative of the, the big picture mm -hmm. well and because the live strong program is a set amount of time but you're really giving people the tools to, to go beyond that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a 12-week program, um, so they're coming twice a week for 12 weeks. And the goal really is to support people in developing a program that they feel like they can sustain over the long haul. And then we also offer, um, we have an alumni club, so um, we really do try mm -hmm. to continue to support the survivors and their families. Um, over the long haul. So we have folks who continue to engage for, for years, years beyond their 12-week program so that they still have that, um, that community and that social emotional support, but then also that support with maintaining healthy active lifestyles, which is often not easy. Most of us will kind of start and stop. And Nicole, you have an orientation coming up. We do, yes, on Wednesday, November 6th at 5 p.m. And so anyone who's interested in learning about the program or registering for our um, winter sessions uh, can come. Uh, we spend about an hour where they can learn about the program and then they can do their required pre-registration interview right after that. Okay, very good. Ladies, thank you so much. Great information this evening. And that is going to do it for this edition of Health Matters. If you'd like to learn more about tonight's topic, we've posted links at ksps.org. And be sure to join us on November 21st when we will take you inside Sacred Heart Children's Hospital. Until then, I'm Teresa Lukens. Health Matters is made possible with the support of Washington State University Health Sciences Spokane and Providence Healthcare. With every twist and shout and uphill battle, we see you, you who trusts us to take care. Providence, health for all, care for you.